right, Nav, do we have a move on at present? Yeah, sounds like it. Yes, we do. We're doing some short 20 meter moves. Okay. like my pen disappeared. It's fine. No, you're not. I've, I've got another one. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate it, though. Yeah. But we had, like, a lot more pens. <laughs> every, every watch, I get less pens. Uh, oh, yeah, I see. So those plates are gone. It's just a little piece of line to hold the line. Line to hold the line. So science, how are we looking for uh, one weight lift? Yeah. Uh, yep. Samples. Do we have room for any more? Yes. Plenty of room in the starboard bio box. B, C, D, R, empty. Slurp. One more slurp available. Three niskins and four push cores. Oh, okay. Uh, we need one more rock, uh, but I think they might have been thinking about collecting it um, at the summit. But if we see anything we like better or anything great, we can collect it. Okay. Hello, Nautilus Live audience. Um, our, we've got our new watch settled in. My name is Jamie. I am the communications lead today. Hi, I'm Opatrencio, watch lead. Corley Rodriguez, I'm in the science seat. Leilani Sablon, data logger. In the front row, this is Megan Putz, navigator. Jake Bonney, currently sitting in the Hercules seat. I'm uh, Robert Waters. I'm sitting in the uh, Argus seat. Dave Robertson, last and probably least. <laughs> I'm in the That's video never. chair. That's no. not true. False, Dave. <laughs> well, we need you. What's do, that? that uh, do we have our images that? up on the website now, Jamie? Our watch images? Yeah. Yes, we do. An issue with those earlier. There we go. The best looking watch team. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be our official name. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think that is, Megan? Um, from far. Well, it's either a uh, serianthid or an anemone. Mm -hmm. It's hard. So remember last night I was telling you about the ring of tentacles around mm -hmm. the uh, the mouth. Yes. Oh, yeah. So as we come in, if we see that, then the it's a serianthid. Mm -hmm. If we don't see it, zoom in there, Dave. It is something else. Ooh, ooh, pretty. Yeah, so this actually has that ring of tentacles I around the mouth. Yeah. You see that? So, so this is a serianthid. This is one of those ones that can get up and swim away from you. Mm. Oh, nice. There have been attempts in the past to sample this, and uh, it just sort of took off. <laughs> wow. What is the common name for this? Uh, they're called tube anemones, but this one doesn't have a tube, so <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> They, they have these like tubes that you might find them in rocks and like little crevices or in the sediment. But this particular one is more free living. 
Ah, uh, the free living anemone. It's got a nice ring to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the free living non tubed anemone. <laughs> So we'll stick to the plan here. Uh, keep heading up to the waypoint, uh, and we'll see if it's if it's highly looks like it might be highly sedimented beyond that waypoint. Maybe we can lateral along the uh, depth contour and look at rockier substrate. Sounds good. Um, Seventeen hundred meters. What would be the ascent time, uh, Bob? Uh, we got to slow down at the flanges, so we add a little bit to it. It's like but two hours, about, I think. Yeah. If it's about two hours, what we might do then is wait until 10.15 to recover. Uh, that way folks are... If, yeah. if they're at the service at 12.15, folks will be finished with lunch, and we don't want to pause too long at 50 meters. Uh, the, uh, that would heat up the uh, samples. Yeah. Megan, could you pull the... Oh, yeah. Okay. What's the water temperature down there with Herc right now? It is... I just had it. 2.52. Oh, balmy. <laughs> so these, these deep sea octopuses that Nautilus discovered in uh, 2018, I believe it was, uh, on Davidson Seamount, are clustered along a s these uh, seeps, where the uh, the ambient temperature is about there. Oh yeah, ambient temperature is about 2.5, or you know what it is around oh, here. What's that? <clears throat> but the seep temperature is about 10 Celsius. And a recent paper uh, speculates that uh, that's speeding up the development of their eggs. Uh, it would normally take about 12 years for them to hatch in that water, in a, the ambient water temperature, but at 10 Celsius, only two years. Uh, so the octopuses have figured that out somehow, and it gives their uh, young an advantage. Uh, they're less, less time in the egg is less vulnerable to predation. Pretty amazing. Water temperature makes a big difference. One of the things we're trying to, you know, they're documenting the conditions where we find the organisms in the deep. Um, they've evolved to in pretty steady state conditions, not a big temperature swing at these depths. But as the oceans warm, the, the warmth is, uh, the heating is spreading down to the deep ocean uh, very slightly, but it'll be, we don't know how they'll adapt to rising temperatures. Do you think that species will just move deeper? Yeah, and then you have to consider oxygen and pressure, and yeah, I, I don't know. I suppose some can't go too much deeper, at least on the easily. Yeah, I mean, their larvae are transported by currents, and they land where they land. It was uh, interesting, though. Apparently, you know, th there wasn't the expectation to find all these uh, corals at 3,500 meters on this dive on the, in that uh, on the boulder that they came across shortly after they, we reached bottom. That's probably where we've seen the most diversity so far on this dive. Yeah, that's kind of surprising. Yeah. Uh, that we saw such great diversity down deep. And now that we're almost at the summit of the seamount where you'd expect to see 
you know, high density coral communities, we're not really seeing too much in terms of those high density areas. Yeah, the current flow must be here to transport nutrients, but there's just apparently not many nutrients raining down from above, so. Well, and also there's just a lot of sedimentation and that could deter settlement from corals onto these uh, uh -huh. hard substrates. Yeah. But you don't even see like a lot of sea cucumbers. I mean, we've seen some, but there's not even a lot of uh, sediment life. Tripod fish are finding something. <laughs> they Bridge seen down. a bunch of those. You're kind of getting off the line there. Good. Can we do another 20 meter move? Zero two three. Thanks. There's another anemone up ahead on that rock. Might be another one of those black serianthids, like the one we just looked at. Oh, good eye. Took me a while to spot it. Yeah, look at those long tentacles. There's a fish. Can we zoom oh, the yeah. fish? That's more important. <laughs> so I think this is a type of cusk eel. Hey, it's Dave. Very can small. Yeah, you know, can we try up? Oh, maybe try to center up on the 4K. Megan, you have a great eye for catching these things. <laughs> You just have to look for those movements in the water. It has a really big head, but is this different from the one we saw last yeah. last night? Yeah, so I think this is a juvenile. Um, I don't think it's Acanthonus armatus. It's probably something like Bazazetus. Okay. But uh, given how tiny it is, it's a juvenile cuskill. Dave, let's see if we can get a shot of this uh, this anemone on the 4K. Okay. Say so when. All right. Right it okay, Ooh, when? Ah. Oh. There's something in there. Okay. All right, thanks. You need that scoot over some. You get Yanking on me. <laughs> how long is how long is this tether that you have? Uh, it's like thirty three meters. Okay. This is a standard length.
So how would we describe the these rock formations here? Uh, it's a little hard to tell, but um, I feel like here, that looks pretty sheet flowy to me. Um, pillows kind of are bigger and like fluffier looking, and this is pretty flat, so I would call this a sheet flow. And our, you'll have to excuse my uh, geography 101, <laughs> geology 101, but those are formed differently? Yeah. So uh, sheet flows are kind of just like a normal way. Lava flows down kind of as a sheet, just if you think like a big mass kind of uh, like thinner. And then uh, pillow lavas are formed when uh, the outside cools really quickly. It quenches and crystallizes and then you shoot more magma underneath it and it creates this tube underneath and kind of inflates it a bit to kind of a pillow shape. Thank you. So just a sea cucumber right there, Megan? That is a sea cucumber. Oh. So that's a Paleopodites. And as we get close to us, close to it, uh, it will probably swim. Mm -hmm. These ones like to take off. Oh, and there's another, another fish. fish. So that looks like a halosaur. We saw a few of those last night. They have a Coral. thin dorsal fin. Yep, they're very thin, skinny. Can They've got sort of like a duck bill kind of <laughs> looking face. Could we try to zoom on its head? Yeah, you can zoom, Dave. Got a nice white background there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Always cute. Yeah. <laughs> It looked like a mouse to me. I, I was thinking the same thing. It was big eyes. Yeah. Yeah, they're pretty adorable. Thanks for that zoom. Nice. So cute. Oh, what's in the sediment there above? Is that a... Cucumber? Flattened out cucumber. Yep, Paleopodites. You got it. Pancake cucumber. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's pretty f three dimensional. It just sort of scrunched up. Yeah, oh, it's the uh, camera angle. Yeah. In the 4K, it's more tubular. Yeah. You're looking down at it. It's a very oh, pretty it periwinkle goes. color. It's going <laughs> to swim. You see, it's like getting ready. <laughs> Senses us. There's gonna go. There you go. Oh, making more sediment. Well, you gotta, you know, lighten the load when you take off for a swim. Right. Drop some ballast. It's just so elegant the way they take off. Such a blobby, <laughs> floppy sort of way. And is that its mouth? It is. So we're looking at this 4K oh, camera that cool. is not going out. But okay. Okay. All right. Oh, we've got current flow here. We got some substrate.
So a lot of pillow lava in the Galapagos Rift Zone, and uh, after you look at that for two or three hours, you are seeing all sorts of things. <laughs> Mind plays games on you. <laughs> Bridge nav. Can we move another 20 meters, zero two three? So, Coralie, that that difference would be determined not only by temperature but chemical makeup of the lava. Um, I don't think so. I just think it's the it's it the really the difference is just kind of the morphology of it. Um, because you can get any of these either pillow lavas or sheet flows or lava tubes. All of these you can get with in one single eruption event. Okay. Um, but it is important to note that as things are erupting, uh, the chemistry does change, but um, I don't know if that necessarily has an effect. I just think it's, it probably has something to do with like the mechanics of like the structure and stuff like that. So, like Adam Sewell might, <laughs> might yeah. know a little bit better. So science team, our audience is asking what kind of rock samples we're looking for right now. Yeah, so um, for rock samples, one we're looking for ferromanganese crust, um, which are these rocks that form out of the ambient seawater and they form onto basalt, which is another rock that we're looking for. Um, we're looking for some fresh basalt so that we can uh, date these seamounts to better understand the history and uh, kind of a lineage. We collected a pretty good sample, I think, for dating last yeah. on our last watch. Yeah, within the monument boundaries, we're limited to 10 rocks per dive, and we have one left. So we're hoping the amazing rock makes itself known to us yeah. within the next few hours. Coming up, right here? Yeah. That's what you're talking about. It looks different. Mm -hmm. That looks like an acorn worm from a distance. Maybe um, not, no. No, I don't think it's an acorn worm. It's probably a sea cucumber. But it does have that kind of look to it. It's just not a big enough bulb on the top. Yeah, and usually, Acorn worms, they have a nice trail following behind them. Yeah. More velvety looking. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, Cucumber. Quick zoom on that. That is colorful. That's a nice mm -hmm. color. Mm hmm. I think we're seeing a lot of purple shades today. Yeah, a lot of these deep sea cucumbers are purples and pinks. It's kind of ombre. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It does have a very nice ombre going. It's very stylish. <laughs> sea cucumber. You gotta be styling in the deep sea. Tough to focus on this guy. Very. Yeah, I think it's because it's so transparent. Yeah. So translucent there. It's got lots of layers to it. So you see like the yeah. outer part of it 
is like really gelatinous and then it has a sort of firmer inner body. Perfectly uh, squishable. Yeah. <laughs> There's a stock crinoid over on the starboard side I saw. There's another sea cucumber. Yeah, more, more orange. We have a diversity of sea cucumbers. Mm -hmm. We can start a garden. <laughs> <laughs> Yum. Now. It's an interesting herc shadow. Can we do another 20 meter move, zero, two, three. Thank you. It's kind of spooky. Looking through the grates on the porch. Well, could you elaborate a little bit on the importance of this area and why we have specific rules for sampling and how much we can take? Well, the monument is established to protect um, the uh, creatures in that area from human activity. So they'll permit some uh, collections for scientific purposes, but it's not unlimited. So we want to just establish some, some controls, some reasonable, and they're very reasonable uh, from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on impacting the environment. So in order to collect uh, an entire organism, for example, you'd need to see that there are at least 10 in the area so that they're not affecting the population. But the uh, establishment of national marine sanctuaries and national monuments have, you know, it's proven to uh, help with conversation, conservation efforts, there's a spillover effect where the fish Ooh. are able to uh, increase the sustainable numbers and they spill over and provide, you know, better fishing outside the monument. Here we're looking at a new anemone that we haven't seen before. This is an Actinostolidae. So an anemone in the family Actinostolidae. Um, can't go much further on the idea than is that. But this is the one that I we call Actinostolidae bulb because it has these little bulbs on the ends of its tentacles. And we think that it's something different from the other ones that are in the same family. So we like to designate it with a little um, con concept name. Oh, so cute. Wow. That is yeah. cute. I've seen them come in lots of different colors from like this sort of pinky orange to yellow and white. So how do they stay firm on the substrate? They basically suction cup themselves onto the rock. Get some good so. screen grabs there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. if it wanted to, it could probably detach itself or move itself along the rock. Nice.
first ever sample I took was one of those things. Huh. Oh yeah. And I crushed it. <laughs> <laughs> you did the sample really well, or? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, the other, the other crush. <laughs> Another it, it looked like it looked like an hourglass when it's, when it's supposed to be like a Is cylinder. A fish? <laughs> yeah, a tripod, I think. So these fish are called tripods. Tripod fish. Yep. <laughs> what does the tripod refer to? <coughs> the fins that the ventral fins that uh, allow it to kind of perch on the seafloor. Its tail and fins form a triangle. That makes sense. Very nice uh, balance. Oh, another fish. They point into the current. Another halosaur. Halosaur. Yep, that is a halosaur. <laughs> Do they always come? Because these look smaller than the rat tail or the cuskeel, so are they always smaller than those? Oh, yeah, they're always small and skinny like that. Okay. Is then that's an adult? Yep, that's okay. an adult. Bridge nav. Can we do another 20 meter move, zero, two, three? Thank you. Uh, speaking of the monuments and sanctuaries, there's uh, Noah has a is conducting a study to uh, to support congressional action to designate the Papahanaumo Kuakea Marine National Monument as a national marine sanctuary, which would uh, increase the protections, uh, writing them into law. And I believe there's another sanctuary to uh, proposed off of the California coasts. Uh, I think it's a Chumash, Chumash Heritage <laughs> <laughs> National Marine Sanctuary. And for anyone interested, when NOAA is going through these processes, the public absolutely has a chance to have their voice heard. Um, and when the comment periods are open, if it's directly related to a site that we're just exploring in, we will link to those. But otherwise, if a quick Google search and you can find online how to read more about it, but also how to have your comment logged by NOAA on what you think about the process and what you think should happen. Yeah, NOAA National Marine Sanctuaries should have some information on that. Yeah. Yeah, you just tab through it, yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. There's a shortcut for that, I think. But like, you could you could copy the row and then paste it down. And then the the time shortcut is Control Shift semicolon, I think. You see what I'm putting. And I believe we've mapped just about a half, not quite half, of the the national. Uh, of the U.S. EEZ, which includes monuments and sanctuaries, but the, the U.S. exclusive economic zone, we still have a ways to go to mm. map and explore. I think we're at 40, is it 48 percent? I think so. And then 52 percent left? They just released the new statistics. That sounds right. It sounds like a lot until you realize that's just the EEZ and then... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Control shift semi well, that's more U.S. territory than is on land. Yeah, uh, fair enough. Yeah, it's a lot of a lot of territory. And then uh, you know it's U.S. easy because it's 200 nautical miles from from land. And that's an international. Uh, that's an international standard. standard yeah. yeah, part of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Yes, and close. Which the U.S. actually isn't a part of. <laughs> Has not ratified it. But we do follow the uh, regulations. Yeah. 
You want to check out that, uh, looks like a stock crinoid, lower left. Sure. Let me just come up on the... You got it? All right. <coughs> right on that ridge, that little rock? Yeah, that little base. straight line of rock. Oh, shrimp. <laughs> oh, I love these. Yeah, so this is a sea lily or a stocked Ooh. crinoid. This one is Proisocrinus. Kind of looks like a mini palm tree. <laughs> kind of. Very tropical. <laughs> and that's a really pretty dark color. Yeah, it's like a very red color. So this is Proisocrinus rubarimus. try a little bit longer move or is this good good pace um you can put it up like a 50 I mean, it okay. it's been pretty yeah constant so it's like gonna start to level faces. out a little bit more yeah all right bridge nav can we do a 50 meter move zero two three Thanks. This rock looks promising. There's gotta be something on it. I guess not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Was there a crinoid yeah, there? Yeah, stocked crinoid. Yeah, that's another one of those uh, Proisocrinus crinoids. Mm -hmm. oh. 
So you got a couple there. <laughs> yeah, count those crinoids. <laughs> and then a little shrimp over there. Two crinoids. Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh. <laughs> That might be a coral on the rock there. Yeah, that little. That fuzzy bit. I was looking at the one underneath, but there's on also that the white. rock there. No, the white's just sediment. Oh, okay. Yeah, patch. The, the yeah. Fuzzy in the underhang. Ah. I'm not seeing it. Oh. Right yeah, there. Yeah. yeah, where the lasers are. Oh, and something like really small swimming mm -hmm. to the right. Zoom in there. Yeah, it's like so a flower. That's a polychaete that yeah. was swimming. It could actually be one called swimmer. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this might be a hydroid. Yeah. Yeah, how branchy it is, uh, thin filaments. Or it's a coral that's partially dead and there's hydroids growing on it. There's an associate with it, some sort of ophiroid, maybe. Yeah, that's a challenging one. It's like yeah. underneath this giant rock. Yeah. You know, if I lateral those, too much of a shadow. Have you, have, uh, you noticed much of uh, any current effects on the vehicles? Uh, not as much right now, but yeah. uh, earlier I was battling a little bit. Huh. Oh, there's a cool fish. Yeah. Ah, good eye. Yeah, I didn't even see it. Cuscule? Yeah, you got yeah. it. Cascules also tend to be the slower of the swimmers when you see them. They, they seem to take their time, whereas the halosoids move a little faster. Get a zoom on that head. Yep. It's pretty cute. He's backing out of here. <laughs> so cuscules are in the family Opidiidae. Opidiidae. They're a type of eel-like fish. Uses undulating body motion to swim. It's very efficient swimming.
coming up a bit, Bob. An audience member would like to know if the huskills would survive at surface pressures or if they're solely deep sea creatures. Yeah, they definitely wouldn't survive the journey to the surface. Mm -hmm. So um, in times where these animals have been collected in baited traps, they, um, they expand too quickly as they get to the surface. So their, their eyes and things will bulge out. That's why uh, the blobfish got its name. Uh, fishermen had caught it. And in the deep ocean where they live, they're actually pretty cute. Mm -hmm. um, but when the pressure change from coming up from the deep sea affects their body so that they bloat. So yeah, these fish wouldn't survive living shallower. Um, not it's like you're used to living in your really nice air-conditioned home and you get thrown into the desert or an oven <laughs> like <Yeah>. basically cut, <laughs> cooks them <laughs> or like moving from earth to space because like there's no pressure <laughs> yeah it would it's a very traumatic experience so mm. we like to leave these fish down here where they're happy A really nice way to sample these like larger predators in the deep sea is by deploying baited traps. Um, they're not traps in that we're going to bring them back to the surface, but they're camera traps where we collect images of the animals that get attracted to the camera and the bait. And so there are cuskeels, rat tails, they're basically the, you know, apex predators of the food chain down here. They tend to be scavengers looking for, you know, a nice meal. So they'll come from long distances to to get a good snack. How deep are we right now? We are at 1739 meters. So we're at 1739 meters and to the audience member who wants to know how deep we can go, ROV Hercules can go to about 4,000 meters, although I don't think we get down that deep. We get close. We do get pretty close. Bridge now. Can we do a 50 meter move, zero, two, three? Thanks. There's a little something something on that rock. Could be a slime star or a sea cucumber. I'm gonna get a quick zoom. There it is. Cucumber? Yep, it's a cucumber. Another slightly different one to add to our garden. All right. Got to catch them all.
Ooh, that looks like a polyopagon. What's that? Sponge? A sponge. Polyopagon. It's fun to say. Sounds like a Pokemon. <laughs> Probably <laughs> is a Pokemon at this point. If not, uh, they better get on it. So they see some of these sand ripples in front of Herc in the Argus view. Uh, if, if they're symmetrical, that shows that they're created by waves. And so if Herc is not feeling the effects of currents right now, then that suggests that and the symmetrical form of the waves suggest it's tidal. So these waves, internal waves generated by the tide as it hits the slopes. There was a bamboo coral. Oh, really? Just, yeah, just... Uh, Right, center screen on that rock, on the lower rock. Yeah, so those currents would be favorable for corals and oh, sponges. And that's because they're filter feeders, right? You're right. So they need food delivered to them. It's like the currents are the grub hub of the deep ocean. <laughs> <laughs> So here's a small bamboo coral. We haven't seen a coral in a while, so we gotta get our good shots. Is it in there, Dave? Nice. Is there a f something behind it? Uh, oh, see yeah. that worm? Yeah. Or I think it might be a sea star or mm -hmm. um, ophiorite. Sure. Thanks. There's a bunch of little stuff here around here. Yeah, it's crazy what you see when you zoom in. Mm-hmm. All the way. What are these little, like, hair? Hair things. Yellow hairs? Yeah. Um, so amphipods make those, and they live on them, usually as a pair. They're like little amphipod sticks. That would be sweet. That's like the hardest. What's that back there? Yeah, the little like gelatinous thing? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, huh. It could be one of those Mega Mouth tunicates or, or something like that. It's hard to tell from this angle. And there you can kind of get a better look at what I think is a worm down there. Yeah, it could be a polychaete or an arm of something. Uh-huh. It is look, looking like it's moving more like a polychaete, so I think you might be right. It's a worm. Here it goes. Oh, yeah. look at that. With the angle, it's like we're just getting a glimpse into their landscape. Yeah. I wonder what the, like, still cam sees. It's, got, it's lower, a lower view. Okay. Yeah, and I think there was a Brasingid sea star on that rock too. Down, down here, uh, kind of hiding. Right, right uh, to the left of the lasers. You see those yeah. little arms sticking out? Poke. Yeah, sticking out. Oh, oh. yeah. All the animals are hiding from us. Mm -hmm. What kind of sea star is that, Megan? It's a Brasingid. Um, I don't think they have a real common name, but they're filter feeding sea star. So they, they put their arms up into the water column and it has these little sticky pads on the ends of their spines. And that's what they use to capture food. 
Very cool. It's bigger than I would imagine sea stars to be, or longer, I suppose. Mm hmm. Yeah, they, they can get pretty big. The Argus view shows a small fish approaching. Oh, yeah. I think it might be a shrimp. Yeah. <laughs> Here it comes. It's on oh, the yeah. Move. So, this is one of those uh, Ceratospis monstrosus, the giant deep sea red shrimp. They're one of those uh, predators that likes to come to baited traps. They'll swim right at ROVs because they're like, oh, what you got? <laughs> Anything good? But they have those really big uh, antennal spines, you know, those big rounded structures on the front. That is a big shrimp. It's a very big yeah. shrimp. <laughs> it's shrimply amazing. <laughs> That was a good rock. It was. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be sediment for a while. So one of our audience members wants to know about the uh, am I pronouncing this right? Brisingid sea stars that we just saw? Mm -hmm. And whether or not they move similar to other sea stars or if they're more sedentary? Um, they can easily move around, but they tend to stick in one place. So they, they'll find a nice rock to perch on and they'll stick there. Um, they tend to really like wrecks. So if you find um, a shipwreck or, or other piece of uh, man-made structure, they will perch upon it. Uh, that gets them up off the the sea floor where there's a little bit more water flow. So like our corals and sponges, they're trying to filter feed and capture food from the water columns. So they want to be in an area where they're getting a lot of flow. Okay. Bridge nav. Can we do a 50 meter move zero two three? Thanks. So would you consider these symmetrical? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, if it's shadow or yeah, uh, looking down at the 4K, it's kind of. Another oh, fish. sea pen or, so, or Looks like a has a little halosaur. Uh. It's very ripply sediment. Yeah, for sure. I would annotate it as sediment ripple. Another shrimp. Mm-hmm. There's a few of them. Ooh, oh, yeah. It's a shrimp congregation. <laughs> I 
I really like how they move their pleopods, those swimming legs. It's so graceful. Mm -hmm. Turn it into me. There's another one up ahead. So to answer some questions coming in from our live audience, um, our expedition currently will be out to sea until about April 4th, 5th, that's the plan? We'll uh, arrive in port on the 5th. So we'll probably start our transit north uh, sometime on the 1st, maybe the evening of the 1st, maybe. And we do have uh, quite a few other dive locations uh, pinpointed for this expedition. We do. We've just been waiting for the... Sea state to uh, clear in the northern part of the EEZ, uh, and it does look favorable later this week. But uh, so we may try something a little bit uh, northeast of here um, this evening. So our lead scientist Steve Oskovich is looking at uh, some potential sites for for a dive, maybe around uh, maybe around time. If the ROVs are able to to turn around by then, and the sea state's agreeable. Can we get a screen grab of this? It's a nice shot of the fish with the ripples. Right. Go for a zoom there. Yep. Thank you. 
And for those who might not know, does, uh, do you want to explain the scaling lasers a little bit? Because this is kind of a perfect view for them. Yeah, so the lasers are spaced 10 centimeters apart. So I think this guy's about 20 centimeters long, head to tail. Choose green because it will propagate further in the ocean water than red. Megan, you're not on SPL. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it makes it easier to measure uh, red and pink color corals uh, if you have the green lasers instead of red. <laughs> I see rock. Yep. Okay, so yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, sometimes I forget. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, here's a good thing to look at. Ooh. A rock with the coral on Yay. it. Yay. Yay, finally. And a uh, sponge. It's like the only rock and then... Yeah, you can zoom in here, Dave. Oh, no, that was my eyes playing tricks on me. It's a couple of corals. Yeah, so there's a... In the background, that yellow one is a plexorid coral with a snake star on it. And then in the front, this nice, really beautiful one... Um, is a Caligorgia. So it's a type of primnoa coral. You know it's Caligorgia because you have these very nice pinnate branches where you have these short branches that come off on either side looking like, like feathers basically. And then you have the snake stars that are wrapped around all the branches. Snake stars? Snake stars. Yeah, we call them snake stars because they have these really snaky arms. Mm, okay. On the primnoa, there's also an amphianthus, an anemone, that is living on the coral, and I'm seeing hydroids on there too. So a so lot of these this? corals support lots of different animals. Yeah, that little pink thing. Okay, what was that, the anemone? Yeah, that's the anemone, and then the hydroids that white branchy bit There's near the base, yeah. Okay. Oh. Is that behind that rock? Is that just dead uh, dead yeah. part of it or dead? Yeah, a dead piece of coral. It actually kinda looks like a gold coral, um, but it could be a lot of things. What, what's just to the left of the lasers there on the far side of the rock? And there are also some crinoids. Maybe that's what I was seeing. Uh, the one right into the lasers? Uh, let's see, under, yeah, I thought there was something there, but... Yeah, right where the lasers are. You zoom in there, Dave? Yeah, so this is a um, crinoid called Glyptrometra, Glyptrometra later lateralis. Is this a swimming crinoid? It is. It will swim. Ooh. It sort of undulates its arms. I love the swimming motion. It's so cool. Yeah. And then I it's think there's mesmerizing. A, maybe a small bamboo or uh, in. Oh yeah. Closer yeah, there was to like us. a little primnoid, yeah, just a little bit down. Primnoid. Okay. Yeah. Oh. A little hermit crab? Yeah. Oh, and, and I just living in a tube. Star. Ooh. Bamboo. Bounce. <laughs> oh, I chased him away. <laughs> Is he living in a piece of coral? Huh. <laughs> it does look like a piece of coral. What is going on there? 
Oh, oh. wow. Oh, I think it's um, a shell of a pteropod, and it's got some anemones or something on it. It looks like a kazoo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it does. It's definitely a kazoo. What do, what do I know? <laughs> Let's see. If, uh, no, he's moving. Must be challenging to carry around something so long. Oh. Can we try to get the 4K centered up on that little guy? Sure. Maybe challenging, but you do what you do for fashion. Exactly. <laughs> uh, fashion uh, over function. If, if it's too hard. That's all right. We got a nice view in the her It's definitely camera. the most fashionable her crab <laughs> I've seen. Is it that? Uh, is I think he's right. I think it's already. Can you zoom in on the 4K? There's two of them. Oh, so that's a different. Yeah. That might be okay. the different. So I'm gonna pick up. He's at the. It might be this. Top of one. that. Upper right. Upper right, yeah. Nice. Oh, I see, I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. But you did see the same thing. It's just two of the same opioid. Oh, and then there's some red, red thing. Uh, it's a little tricky, I know. Let's see if I can get it. Let's see if I can get it. Whoa. All right, Dave, let's see if we can get, that's a, not the greatest shot, but it's pretty good close-up of him. Actually, I think you're right, Jake. Got it. it is a piece of coral. Got it. Thank you. It looks like sclerotinian coral Was that coral a 4K? Coral kazoo. Yep. Coral kazoo. Thank you. That's impressive. Yeah. It's ingenuity. Good mm -hmm. job centering up on that. Uh, yeah. It was weird. It's usually not like that. Or, I mean, it's so small, it would probably just had a little little hollow that yeah. the crab is in. You're dragging around a solid piece. A solid item. piece of coral. <laughs> it's strength. Yeah. Nice protection. Kind of vain. <laughs> <laughs> Spend a lot of energy yeah. carrying that around. <laughs> Trying so to it might good. be hard to find, you know, nice like size shell around here. Yeah, you work with what you got. So someone would like to know what is the difference between snake stars and basket stars? Um, they are related. Uh, but basket stars, their arms branch many, many times forming a basket, whereas snake stars, their arms do not branch. Thank you. Bridge nav. Can we get a 50 meter move, zero, two, three? Another Thanks. crinoid. Yeah. It's a nice picture of it. Oh, I feel a sponge coming on. Oh, yeah. Right up here. Yeah. Ooh. Oh, oh. <laughs> hello. Photobobbing shrimp. Oh, and a black coral. Is this uh, Faraday? Hey, zoom in there, Dave. It doesn't look to be doing too hot. You see that it um, it looks kind of dusty. It's getting kind of full of sediment. But this is a tritopleura, or sort of a leafy type sponge. Why why wouldn't it be doing great? Just so usually um, the sponges like to keep the dirt off of themselves, but this one has a bunch of sediment sort of trapped on its surface, and so it's getting clogged up. If it gets too clogged, uh, it won't be able to feed very well, so it'll end up moving on. How do they normally keep the sediment off of themselves? So they have their cells that have little cilia, and they basically just are always moving, and the water is flowing through them, and so they clean, self-clean themselves. Oh, so this one's just 
letting itself go. Yeah, it could be, or it's just there's so much sediment coming down here that it's, Can't it's keep having it. trouble, which is why we're not seeing too many um, animals. And then there was a black coral off to the lower right. Oh. There was some talk in the science chat earlier about there some species is. of black coral that can oh, okay. grow in the sediment. Oh yeah, um, there are a couple species that will grow in sediment. So there's the uh, schizopathies and abyssopathies. And the way you can tell the difference is the way their branches are curling upwards or downwards. But they'll basically sweep around in the current and root in the sediment. What are we looking at here? So I think this is a bathypathies. Can zoom in, Dave. So a type of black right. coral that has this sort of, again, a pinnate structure where you have alternating branches on either side. A bunch of the branches seem to have broken off. Uh, maybe it's not bathypathies. So this, these branches have branches. So this might be something different. Um, perhaps a staropathies, but it's not branching quite in the same way as staropathies. It is a bit odd. It could be worth a sample if we would like. Yeah, maybe we could snip a snip the tip portion of a branch. Okay. Do we need to uh, hold or? Uh, Are you doing it? I'm doing it. Snipping. Uh, oh yeah. Then what Pinch do you do with that snip? Uh, yeah, I guess. What do you think, Megan? Can we hold position, please? Thanks. Snip and then slurp the branch. So snip and slurp works well. Yeah. Okay. So an empty one. Okay, before or after you stick luck? Oh, okay. Alright, uh, yeah. Oh, because then it, it'll come back. Yeah. This, yeah. We're just snipping. Snip it and then bring it over. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's see. The cutters are here. Um, do you know where you want? Uh, the easiest branch, yeah, just on a piece of a branch, uh, whatever is easiest to reach. Okay. Can you zoom in there, Dave, a bit? Emil and Coralie, um, Bridges let me know that there is some rain approaching, so there might be high winds. Okay. All right. Is 
that a good? Well, they may have trouble holding station if the winds get too strong. But uh, they've been, yesterday they were gusting to like 22. Nice. Ooh, very nice. Or, this can or, go in starboard bio box B, as in boy. Uh, we're oh, going to slurp we're it. Slurp, we're oh, slurping. slurp. Okay. Yeah. So we have one more slurp left, and that's on seven. Oh, it's still on flush. Still flushing. Oh, uh, that was written down in the notes. It's spin jammed. Hmm. I think you could go into it. Oh, there we go. Oh. Yeah, sometimes you gotta like go back and forth and like. Leilani, is this sample 17 or 18? Sample 18. 18. That's <laughs> <laughs> that little cup coral we got last watch. We've got some sponge, that's four. four. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Give her the beans. This <laughs> uh, five five. I had to go all the way around. <laughs> yeah. Six. 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 Hi -ya. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's let's put some, be. some beans. More beans. Hey, you got beans. You want to zoom in on it? Oh. Yeah. Uh, there you well, go. Yep. There it is. Yeah, there it is. Oh. Well done. Okay, so that's it for the slurp samples. Or the last one. <laughs> Why are they called black coral if they don't look particularly black? Their skeleton is black. Okay. Yeah, so a lot of the corals are named after what color their skeleton is. So the Chrysogorgids are called golden corals because their skeleton has a sort of golden luster to them. Um, pink corals and red corals, their skeleton is pink and red. Sponge. Now it was a... Coming uh, back around on heading here. Yep. Back to... Zero two north. three? Or yeah, zero two three. Yep, zero two three. A uh, bit of a rock, rock face there. Yeah, I stopped our move, so we are currently sort of settled out. Nice. Another sponge on this. That's a nice one. Oh, yeah. I'm going to have to come up a bit, Bob. Okay, thank, thank you.
It looks like the wind speed came up to 14 and a half knots. Not too bad. All right. I got to catch back up. And Megan, if I remember right, the it was a species of black coral that was dated to 4,000 years off of Hawaii. Yes, oh, wow. yeah. Black corals are one of the longest lived known organisms. Along with uh, the gold coral, which is actually uh, parasitic on top of bamboo coral, and it takes over the bamboo coral body. And so those have been recorded to live well over 2,000 years old. And I think the oldest known living organism is a bamboo coral. Oh. Wow. More than 4,000? More than 4,000. Wow. It's either the, it, it comes in the close, I think, both the bamboos and the, the blacks. The blacks, wow. They're very, very long lived. So uh, people have been calling them the bristle cone pines of the deep. <laughs> It just blows my mind, though, when you start thinking about these, like, ages and what that relates to in terms of, you know, our known history. Like, back when these corals were settling, you know, our humans were just sort of starting our civilization. That's why we sample respectfully. <laughs> They've been around a while. Mm -hmm. Bridge now. Can we do a 50 meter move? Zero, two, three. Did we ever end up getting a push core? Yes, they yeah. did. Yeah. Nice. I think it's right after we uh, gave it a shot. The but same one we were doing? I think so. Yeah. It was very fine. Uh, I was thinking of doing one up here, but maybe uh, maybe waypoint nine where what it's a little that? bit. I don't know. Level. One. Check it out. <laughs> it's alive. Oh, I think it's a pleurobrank. A what? It's a like a nudibranch, but it doesn't have its gills on the outside. What? <laughs> oh, how cute. Yeah, it it's is so really cute. cute. Common names are things like sea hare, or sea slug. It's so tiny. Let's see if we could center that one up on the 4K. Okay, do a quick hop. Yeah, so these guys are uh, in the gastropoda, so related to snails, but they do not have shells. Almost. This little one is on the move. Yeah, he's moving. Let's get ready, Dave. Uh, see if I can get it. Oh, standing by. I love their little antenna. <laughs> ah. Almost there.
Sorry, here. Sorry, I keep bouncing back. It's all right. Your auto heading's messing with you on this one. Yeah. Pan and tilt on the 4K. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Especially with little guys like this. Like yeah, this, this is so tiny. Maybe two inches. Really? Slide it. Okay, get ready, Dave. Let's, might just, he might just help us out here. Tell me when. Right, let's try that. Thank you. Yeah, it's about as far in as we can go. Yeah. Yeah, when we zoom really far, you kind of get this like wobble effect. Yeah. But interesting though, those tentacles on the front of the on the sides of the mouth. Yeah, well, those are his eyes. Oh. oh. So he gets, the two stalks are on top of the eyes, and it has like these two sort of feelers on the mouth. Should we zoom in on Herc so that people can yeah. see what we're talking about? Yeah, yeah. so the we audience can see, see what, what we're looking about. at. Check. Yep. Ready. ready. Go for it. Oh. <laughs> Just so, so She's small and squishy looking. So this angle makes it look a little more bulbous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they tend to be pretty rounded. Ooh. Oh, now there's a nice look at the front of it. I think it feels us. It's like, yeah. oh, what's over there? Check it out. <laughs> As we kicked up the sediment, maybe it smelled something good. Yeah, sucking up sediment. It's like, mmm, uh, delicious. Starboard thruster. You start knowing those little yeah, oh. dust devil. <laughs> <laughs> so right, what are these? Sometimes when you do that, you can just turn the joy gain down a little bit to kind of, you know, Will chill it, on Do that. I have to come in a stick lock to do that? No, you can you can, can control it. how much thrust you're doing All by right. dialing down the joy gain uh. yeah, without messing with your stick lock. <laughs> Megan, did you say plural blank? Oh. Yeah, plurobrank. 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 And what are they related to? Go so yeah. they're related to the nudibranchs. Okay. I'm gonna follow so up. if you're familiar with nudibranchs, um, nudibranchs have their gills on the outside, so that's what makes them really frilly and beautiful. And pleurobranchs have their gills on the inside, so this one is very rounded because it just keeps all of that on the inside. All right. um, so they're and in the gastropoda, so also related yeah. to yeah. snails. But these ones do not have shells. Common names are things like sea hare or uh, sea slug. I'm sure there's a lot more common names. People have so many common names for things and each one of those common names is relatively regional based on you know, what you grew up calling something. Sort of like crayfish, some people call them crawdads or yep. mud bugs. So how can that guy be a nudibranch if he doesn't have his gills on the outside? No, it's not a nudibranch. It's a pleurobranch. A uh, pleurobranch. Yeah, okay. but they're related. Okay. Ooh, what's it's that? It's big. Uh... Ooh, oh, it's a big sun. Oh, is it chimera? Oh, these are my favorite. Wow. 
Oh, that's gorgeous. They're so cool. They're some of the coolest fishes. Mm -hmm. Oh my god, that is so neat. You can zoom, Dave. Yeah, we want to try to zoom on the head and shoulders, but yeah, it's clearly a chimera. Yeah, so this is Hydrolagus. And chimeras are really interesting. They're they're not quite sharks, they're not quite fish. Um, so they're their own group. Wow. wow. Nice. That's a great zoom. Do we want to kill the lasers? They yeah, let's kill the lasers. They're named chimera because you can see they have these like sort of lines on on their skin, kind of making them look like they're sort of patchwork together. Yeah. The eyes are like so cloudy. Mm -hmm. And they sort of have a reflective um, film, sort of like how when you see your cat or dog uh, at night and there's a little bit of light, it sort of reflects back. That's where, what we're sort of seeing. Mm -hmm. Gives you better night vision. I forget what that's called. It has a name. Is that the tapetum lucidum? Yeah, that's the thing. Maybe pronounced incorrectly, but I can picture <laughs> the word. <laughs> I just love That's how they just there. Yeah. clap their wow. pectoral fins like wings. Yeah. So graceful. Do you know what they feed on? Um, they'll eat small crustaceans uh, like shrimps. Um, they'll opportunistically feed um, on anything that they can find, pretty much. Is that just camera angle, or does Herc look like it's... <clears throat> I like the view from Argus. You can see how big this uh, Chimera is and compare to Herc. Okay. It's pretty good size. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's uh, swimming out of the light pool, too. You want to zoom in on the Argus view, maybe? A little bit? Only got two hands, Bob. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> These are toes. <laughs> yeah, I want you to zoom on the 4K, the Zeus, and the <laughs> and Argus at the same time. <laughs> Next, you'll want that all in focus. Yeah. <laughs> Bridge now. Can we do a 50 meter move, zero, two, three? Thanks. <laughs> this is definitely one for the highlights reel. Oh yeah. Beautiful shot there, mm -hmm. yeah. I think it knows it's on camera. Yeah, For sure. Him, uh, I am the star. <laughs> like some again, some battle wounds. Good. Some scars. Mm. Yeah, this one's probably a pretty old one. How long do they live, do you know? I don't know. But a lot of the fishes that live down here will live very long lives. So if I were to make a guess, it, it could, you know, be 30 to 50 years old. Wow. According to the Shark Trust online, they are long-lived and can live up to 30 years, likely longer. Ooh. Nice. Oh, so my guess was pretty good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think like most um, sharks and shark-related species, there isn't quite enough data to know for sure, but I would, I would say your guess is spot on. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to capture these and then uh, you can, it, they don't have otoliths in their ears, so aging them becomes mm, right. Their More challenging. Is, their body's so still while they're, they just glide along the bottom. Yeah, so they have a cartilaginous skeleton, sort of like a shark. They do look ancient. Mm hmm.
doesn't seem to be perturbed by our sound. Or no. Not. But this is probably one of the largest things around here, so. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about a sediment core? <laughs> sure. Try it. All right. Well, I'll stop the ship then. Yeah. We've got a little bit of time. Now. Just Can we hold down position? Here. Sure. Uh, you may Thanks. still be moving a little. Okay, I'll get yeah, up we can front then. Can yeah. wait till we settle up. Yeah, at least get out in front. Yeah. Yeah, there's about 20 meters of swing. Roger that. And then we'll uh, remember to get a Niskin after we are 10 meters off the bottom. There's a little round thing. Sample? Sure. Yep. Uh, sometimes it does that. I'm gonna hit it again. I don't know why. There we go. So all the push cores are available except for the one with the ball with the yellow tag, which is the second to the last one. Okay. Oh, so they only collected one. Yeah. yeah. Oh. They kept trying. Okay. So yeah, maybe we'll just try our luck. Are you going to go for the back ball, or are you going to go for one of the other kind? <laughs> <laughs> Dealer's um, choice. <laughs> I might go for the front one. Let's try, try the other one out. So then you got to, yeah, you got to do it like a horizontal thing. Yeah. I don't, I, grabbing those from the top doesn't work Doesn't work out? No. Yeah, okay. top off them. <laughs> oh, try not to do that. Uh, oh. Oh, 
it pushes the drawer out there. It might make it easier. Yeah. You can try it, flip it around, and then maybe you can, it's easier to see it. Like just rotate the jaw all the way around so the little ones are in the front. Ah, uh, yeah. Might want to, if we're just going to do one core, you might want to maybe the next one back. And maybe have, it might make the geometry a little easier. I don't know. Oh, too high, too high. These snaggle tooth jaws are just. And all I don't like them on these kind of. No. <laughs> you can do this, but if you have the parallel. Grabbers are better, yeah. you know. But that's why the, I think the ball is the way to go with these kind of things. I know. I keep grabbing the second one. Yeah. Yeah. I can't grab that one. So, I'm like, so the very back ball, but that's kind of challenging to put back because it's a long reach so oh well, I'll give it a try uh, oh I gotta come up and go it's not as bad with the coral cutters because you got a little more links yeah so yeah we had the regular intermission jaws then it's really long wrong long way to go nice that was you could try just well, uh, you could just try and do the core right there if, it, if you think it's gonna fall out. Uh, like right here? Just right in the view. Like I could pull the box back in. But. Sure. I mean, yeah, you just want to make sure it's option, a non-disturbed area. Yeah. yeah. Or you could bring it around front. It's just. You don't have to go as far. If you do them right off the side, you can just go. <laughs> I'll, I'll try it. I've never done it off the side, but if you can see, I mean, you gotta be able to see if you're straight up and down and all. But yeah. Then. Didn't want to stick up. Now it's going to be. Now it's going to be a challenge to get it back to straight. Yeah. I'll bring it around front now. Oh, yep. you got it. You did good. Well, you can't use that area for coring anymore. No. But he he did good grabbing it again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, he did grab it. <laughs> I did something good. <laughs> um, All right, you want to go back to regular mode? All right. All right, looks pretty soft.
A little deeper than their earlier attempt. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully it stays in there. Right. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'll be surprised if it does. Pleasantly surprised. Yeah, these shallower corals, cores don't have the stickiness factor. Come on, but baby. You never know. Wow. That was a pretty nice one. All right, I'm going quick. Come Get on. over there. Whoop. Oh. <laughs> It's just it's gonna make it. Gone Visibility's gone. Visibility's gone. <laughs> I can't tell. Yeah. Yeah, I, don't, yeah, don't I think you got it. But don't try stabbing in the dark. Just okay, just wait. Yeah. This is where we could try turning the, the joy gain down a little bit to get less thruster wash. There it is. I think it's in there? Well, well you I can, don't know. If you can so. loosen the grip just a little bit. Yeah, it'll yeah, sort don't of. Lose it. Yeah. Don't oh. <laughs> uh -oh. You just loosen, loosen it so it can kind of wiggle in the in the jaws, but not let it all the way go. Should we cannot collect another one? Do you want more than one? Is it, is it all the way in? If I think you gotta keep pushing. Oh, okay. Yeah, a little further down. Seated. Nope. One more, one more oomph from the top. All right, well, if this claw is not suitable for those other ones, we could just settle. Oh, you want to get more? If we, yeah, we're, if we we're, we're requested more. to get paired core samples. Well, Jake, try, well, try <laughs> grabbing it from try. the top, just yeah. see, uh, okay. just okay. curiosity's okay. sake, you know? Okay. Today's yeah. Edge of Your Seat Entertainment brought to you by Nautilus Live and Jake. <laughs> <laughs> So we got several different claws available for Hercules, and the predator arm, and this one's a little tricky with this type of core sampler. This one, of course. Careful, you're torquing the yeah, yeah, yeah. there. There it comes. Ooh. Oh. Yeah, that's the thing. That's the gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, you're up in there now. Oh. Yeah. Yep. Oh. No, you're not. Oh. <laughs> I don't have 
the best grip either. Yeah, that, that might get hung up in the, it might be wedged in the fingers now, you know? Yeah, well, uh, let's see what happens. Yeah, it's wedged in the fingers. That's, these just aren't the, aren't the hot ticket for this. You got it out. Hey. Oh. <laughs> that was interesting. <laughs> Need a toothpick. Yeah. That's probably. Yep. Yeah, that's in there. So, so the deal being like. <laughs> 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 Yeah, you don't want it to wedge in the fingers like that when you're trying to put yeah. it away, for sure, right? So, so you kind of got to do the horizontal thing, and, but you're kind of on your own there. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to force me with you. <laughs> so you got to think about how you, wait, hold on. So you got to think about how you're going to put it away, though. Uh, so you gotta, when you come up, you gotta flip the wrist around the other way, right? So you could so come when at I bring it up from the, you could then, come at yeah. it from the other way, and then you're, you'll be already set up. Okay, and so bring the arm to the, yeah, drop get on this wrist. side and then grab it. Yeah. With the whole wrist flip over, yeah. I think, you know, you got to... Like this? No, no, because you're all the way, you're all mangled up, you know? Like, get straight, get straight it over ahead. there and straighten it up, and then come at it. Because if you go like all that, you're all bang. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Get it, and straighten it out. All the way straight. Yeah, and now, now line up on it. So good. Yep. Stay in there. Oh, it's slowly coming out, I think. Say when on that sample. When? That looks good. Uh. <laughs> Almost. Nice. Oh. There you go. Now you can let go of it. Yay. Oh, look at that. Good job. Awesome. Cool. I'm just gonna rotate out of here. I'm all twisted up. Yeah.
So okay. sometimes it's better like to switch to the, I don't know, which, which uh, wrist mode are you so in? So that was Twisty sample bit? 20? Yes. yes. Like the, yeah. I don't like the twist. Yeah. Yeah. You're in the, yeah, you like the I toggle? I like the toggle. But sometimes it's easier to do the little bit yeah. of, I don't know. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta practice with that. Yeah, I, do, I just don't do it enough. It's just how you get the coordination down. Yeah. There. So I think the people that like to do the horizontal cores like that use the the wrist. The wrist yeah. Yeah. Jake, you've officially been named a legend by our <laughs> audience member. <laughs> that's not me, that's the audience, although I agree. So congratulations. Yeah, that was awesome. So we're looking at about two hours to get to the service. Two hours? Uh what are we at for depth? And we need a Niskin yeah, sample, right? right? 16, yeah, it's, maybe 7. It's like two hours of the All right, That's so it. maybe we, we could uh, come up 10 meters and get a Niskin. Should we wait? We'll be leaving bottom. Should we wait to see if, like, more diversity and abundance? Or, because I think Steve wanted there to be a lot of species around oh no that's for your what, yeah you that's for your eDNA but you want to control where there's no nothing around got it and so that's why we so do we that do wanna, we're going to be covered in mud here for a minute so okay move shake off yeah yeah move a bit yeah. shake it off for those unfamiliar with niskin bottles and why we use them and what they do would you like to explain it yeah. so uh, yeah <laughs> uh they we're, we're um a new fairly new um endeavor in in cataloging with the life in the deep is to collect the water sample and examine it for DNA, environmental DNA. So anything that was passing by that site and shedding uh, parts, body, parts of the body, parts of the skin that would leave DNA behind, uh, we're, we're trying to build up a, a database of DNA and uh, what it represents. This is a much less invasive way to sample the environment. And so we uh, we typically will collect those samples above a, a high density and or high diversity uh, area for corals and sponges, for example. Um, but and then to compare it to the background uh, water, we uh, also collect a control sample as we're leaving the bottom. And and where yeah. And you can also use water samples. So uh, the last cruise I was on, uh, NA-135, I was collecting water samples that corresponded to uh, the rocks that I was collecting. So you can also analyze uh, the water for trace elements. Um, so wow. manganese, cobalt, uh, iron, um, and that can tell you about trace metal cycling in the deep ocean. Um, but the Niskins are pretty cool, so they're a bottle that are open on both sides, and then you can, uh, so water is constantly flowing through them as the ROV is moving. Then you pull a lever so and it triggers like figure out which way uh, the, the top and the bottom any, to snapshot. Just, just go dead stick and see which way you drift. Thank you. And then, and then you want to be facing into the current so that uh, all the muck gets blown behind you. Right? I didn't realize we were using it for geology. That's interesting. Yeah, so uh, my yeah, advisor so and I... It looks that like focus animals. Uh, it's pushing us where we were going. Oh, wait. <laughs> North, uh, northwest. Back. I don't think there's much yeah. much current down there. Right. Okay, well, well that's the way it is. <laughs> we're about 10 meters off the bottom. Okay, uh, and which Niskins are available? Three, two, and one. So any of those three will work. We can go with three. So the Herc pilot's going to trip Niskin bottle number three for us. Collect a water sample. I zoom. Is it zoomed out all the way, Dave, on the Zeus? Are you racked back? Yeah, I'm right back to third from the top. All right. Am I doing it? Yeah. You're doing it. Nope. Just 
drive ahead a bit. Sorry we didn't find a 10th rock sample, but slim pickings up here. Yeah. Nine is pretty good. Nine ain't bad. And we got some good ones. That Camaro is a nice way to end the watch. Absolutely. Besides Jake's legendary performance. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but to go back to your question uh, about using so which one? Get which one again? Three. Three. Uh, uh, all right, pulling. There all it right. goes. All right. So we get the sample. We could also log off bottom, and we can start. It's about to Twelve meters off the bottom. Yeah, we could start up. recovering. Uh, can't see the arm. Oh, yeah. So that was sample 21, is it? Off bottom. Or 20? 20, 21. Good. Um, but I don't think people normally collect water samples for geology. Um, Are we on our so recovery heading? Uh, let's see what we got here. So. Just make sure they're lined up. Yeah. I have yeah, about half a wrap. Yeah. So I mean I wanna do a one I wanna do a three sixty, I believe. Right, I wanna come around to the to the to my starboard to take out that wrap. Now. Yeah, you gotta go. Yeah, clockwise. But I need to. We are leaving bottom. Expect about two hours for uh, our yeah. scent. Drive to the end of my leash. Yeah, I think you're pretty close to there. Okay. You can just take your auto head off and just drive out. Okay. Like 25 percent. 25 percent. And then dial in. Uh, z bias. Yeah, z bias. To hit hit your joy gain 100 percent. Joy gain 100. And I'm going to step out for a moment, talk to Steve about the next dive site. I'll be back for the blue water fun. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you, you just got 100% verticals and then you're good. You don't okay. have to keep. Did, did, did. All right, oh. here we go.
Looks like the porch lights are still on. Yeah. So, Megan? Yeah? We have a question from earlier. Somebody was hoping for some clarification on aging corals and is it the polyps themselves that are that old or are you aging the colony and, and how does that work? Okay. Yeah, so you're aging the colony um, and you can do that by looking at a cross section of the base of the coral. So like trees, corals will put down rings, but these rings are not necessarily annual. Um, so you can't just count the rings in a coral and assume its age, but you can get an age using uh, radiocarbon dating. And that's how we've learned how old these corals actually live. So a sort of interesting story is uh, about the gold coral that lives around Hawaii. Uh, it has this very tree-like structure. Uh, when you see it, uh, it looks almost exactly like a tree branch and with those rings. And they thought those rings were annual because like trees, and you see the structure that looks like a tree, you just assume that it's going to be similar, right? Um, and scientists counted the rings and they're like, oh, well, this animal is probably only like 60 to 100 years old. Um, but lo and behold, after radiocarbon dating, found that that animal was well over 2,000 years old. Wow. Wow. And the growth rate for that gold coral is about 0.2 millimeters per year. So like very, very, very slow. And gold coral used to be collected in Hawaii as a precious coral. So a coral used in jewelry making or the making of fine objects. And with this new knowledge that these corals are very slow growing and provide really important structure and habitat in the deep sea environment, there is now a moratorium on collecting those corals. And so we do not collect gold coral for that purpose mm. anymore. Um, Hawaii is one of the few places where precious corals are actually a managed fishery. Um, currently, there aren't any groups collecting uh, pink and gold or pink coral, which is the managed fishery, as gold coral is no longer allowed to be collected just because of the regulations involved in collecting these corals. You have to send a vehicle down, um, like an ROV or a submarine, to hand pick corals of a certain size. Um, in the past, they were collected by dredging, which destroyed the ecosystem and recovery from those dredging events uh, made it very difficult for the community to recover. And that's a l sort of what my research uh, for my master's was about, looking at how long it takes coral communities in the deep sea to recover after a disturbance event. So I use the lava flows on the big island of Hawaii as the disturbance event. Uh, it basically covers over and creates new substrate to be inhabited by corals after the lava flow is cooled. And by comparing lava flows of different ages, we were able to understand how quickly uh, a substrate can become colonized and how long it might take for the community to develop over time. That's fascinating. Oh, stars. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to change, <laughs> change the thing. The toast reader? Yeah. Let's see. My mom says, great job, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> Thanks, Mom.
Yeah, I, I must have started the wrong Argus one. I thought I just pressed Argus GUI, but I don't know. There's too many options. It says run Argus GUI. So I pressed that. So Jake and Bob, we had um, somebody asking us about routine maintenance for the ROVs, especially on deck maintenance and, and what that looks like. Uh, do you want to go into that a little bit? Uh, we do a lot of, um, uh, we run through a lot of checklists on deck. That's basically, um, you know, most of our duties during, uh, like, in between dives, where, you know, checking every component on the vehicle, electrical, mechanical, um, optical, making sure all the sensors work, and um, running through all the hydraulic functions. Um, yeah, checking to make sure there's no water in the <laughs> hydraulics. Um, washing down the vehicles. Um, try to keep the salt off. Salt's bad for uh, corrosion on all the metal surfaces we have. And um, yeah, and then uh, when, when things go wrong, we have to fix them. Um, yeah, they're in the, the menu. You have to choose the emoji, like, from the list. And then you add it. Okay. <laughs> I thought that was in the water for a second. <laughs> I was like, what kind of sea cucumber? What kind of midwater sea cucumber is that? <laughs> Just a big yet. We have a question coming in about why we use Argus along with Hercules. Uh, we use it's a two-body system, so it allows Hercules to be free-flying. Uh, Argus removes the uh, like the surface heave um, motion that that Hercules would experience if it was directly connected in tension to the ship, um, and then it also just acts as kind of a uh, a spotlight or like uh, watching over um, Hercules. So it gives the pilot extra perspective and some really cool shots of uh, different terrains. I think you're off. Some of our most dramatic shots have been from Argus looking down on Herc and the, you yeah. can get the whole environment in the picture. Mm -hmm. Sense of scale. Were they designed to work together? Yep. And uh, I think this is the first two body system that was really doing all the camera work from up above. Everybody else before that, it was two body, was just kind of using a, a utility camera and just in order to keep the vehicles, you know, lined up. But they weren't trying to go for a good shot from up above. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Back then, we just called it the clump weight. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
it wasn't being used like it is now, you know. It's named after Argus, the Greek god, the Watcher. A lot of the school children are very interested, particularly in the weight of Hercules, because I guess, I mean, that is a pretty fascinating statistic that it's the, the weight of a car, but I think that blows their mind every time. Yeah. Two and a half tons. It's about the size of a car. Yeah. Yeah, yeah like, like a little, you know, smart car or something. Heard a, yeah, yeah, Volkswagen someone, bug comparison. Yeah. That's, uh, that's My height one. could fit in that, I think. <laughs> We had an SCF sit on the porch for a photo, <laughs> a little manned Hercules. <laughs> Lloyd Godson from Australia, he was a fun guy. So Emil, now that you're back, um, we actually had some questions come in about collecting DNA samples um, that I might want to run by you. I might be able to answer. Maybe I'll pull on uh, Megan's expertise, maybe, too. Well, <laughs> we'll anybody see. who would like to chime yeah. in. Sure. Uh, the questions are regarding how we, s how you sort and match the different size DNA parts and snippets and then assign them to specific organisms, and then how you compare them against already collected and analyzed <laughs> organisms. <laughs> so basically uh, the whole process. Right. <laughs> okay, go, Emil. <laughs> I uh, wish <laughs> Meredith Everett was on the chat right now. <laughs> That's... She's our uh, expert ashore who works with the uh, samples. Okay. Um, yeah, I am not equipped with answers for that. That's getting into some uh, interesting details on how they do their work. But uh, I will see if I can find some good references on environmental DNA processing. Yeah, that's more of a Steve question. He knows quite a bit about that. We'll have to bounce that back to Steve when he's on the watch next. But uh, earlier in the chat la uh, last night, Meredith uh, Everett uh, mentioned that they're starting to work on eDNA libraries for sponges now, as well as oh. corals. Uh, it's er they're early in the process. But hopefully, eventually, they'll be able to say more about some of the harder to sample sponges just through the eDNA. Yeah, that would be really neat. Yeah, some of the sponges are encrusting, so it's hard to collect them because you can only get them if you can get the rock that they're on. Oh. So. This um, sampling from the water allows us to get samples that would otherwise need physical parts of the creature. Right. And allows us to bypass that. Yeah, and then you can see what's in the whole community, um, even things that you're not seeing visually. So a lot of these animals are small and they might be behind something else. Um, it's sort of like you know, you're just looking around a room for you see your lump? favorite object, no. and you're, you're focusing the, on certain things. Did we get things. beyond the lump? And it's sort of like a whole catalog of everything that you have in your room. Uh, looks pretty good, right? All right, so we got to pay attention on this and try and see if we can get it. Oh, it's a cheetah nest. <laughs> or an arrow worm. Oh. All right. Oh. There it goes. There it goes. Yeah, those are pretty common in the water column. They wiggle sometimes like fish, so you think sometimes that they're a fish, but they are an invertebrate.
Yeah, just every once in a while, just, yeah, just need to cycle it. So Dan says, you know, because if you have the valve closed, then it, you're trapping that water at that pressure, and then it overpressurizes the arm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, potentially this. You just have to kind of give it a, just a, yeah, just, that's enough just right there, you know. <laughs> so we could try doing the, the windshield wiper maneuver. You go back and forth with the, with the, yeah, just the lateral, you lateral back and forth and it makes it go, it come up faster because you're getting the, because the water is blowing against the starboard box there and, and it slows you down. So if you can get the current to kind of blow it off the box, it, it makes like a three meters a minute difference. For those who are wondering, um, we are doing mapping transit, transects uh, quite a bit during the expedition. We did it all through our transit days and in between yeah, dive sites. So, a lot of mapping going on. Yeah, just, uh, <laughs> yeah. It's just that, you know, the thruster's blowing straight down on the, the top of the box. If you take that box out, it goes up and down really fast. We just don't do it that often. <laughs> like ever. The, the anti-maintenance fence makes it harder to lateral too, by quite a bit. So someone submitted a question for me specifically. I guess um, I forgot that my bio says that I have a love of horror movies, and they want to know if there's any deep sea favorites among them. And you know what? I, I think I'm sadly uneducated in the deep sea horror, but I do tend to like things like Jaws, Deep Blue Sea. I'm sure everyone in here has, has their favorite deep sea film they recommend, horror or otherwise. I stay away from horror movies. I don't mess with horror movies. <laughs> well, we're not going to drop the last week. We don't have that many to spare. And we have a lot of rocks to pick up. So, yeah. Yeah, if we're not dropping it just to gain needed ballast, we hold on to it. Yeah. I guess a perfect storm for me. Not deep sea, but... but it's, Pretty terrifying. But, uh, yeah. The abyss. Especially because it's true. I was going to say, yeah, what about the abyss? The abyss I found uh, somewhat disappointing. It's kind of a <laughs> strange story. A little, a little implausible. Yeah, somewhat. Yeah, it was pretty good up until the aliens. <laughs> <laughs> the first Jaws is still... Oh, you can't beat the first Jaws. Yeah. You simply can't. What about Sharknado? Sharknado. <laughs> well, you got me there. <laughs> Talk about plausible. It's the opposite end of the spectrum. What was that other movie? Meg? That was Meg. Oh, oh, Meg. <laughs> Jason Statham versus the uh, Megalodon. I'm kind of a bad movie fanatic, to be honest. Have you seen all the Sharknados? <laughs> yes, I have. How many are there? Five? Sharknado 2 was a disappointment. Uh, yeah, two's not very good. I liked three. Are there only three? Uh, no, I think there's like six. Okay. <laughs> I was Sharknado for Halloween once, I'm proud to say. <laughs> Here's an interesting question about the Chimera. Um, do old-aged fish get cataracts? 
<laughs> I don't think we know the answer to that. So did I. It's very interesting. I mean, it'll be on the final. <laughs> They definitely have different um, substances and lenses in their eyes than ours, so they might look to, what, to what be what we perceive as cataracts, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's, you know, the same kind of thing. Yeah, and they don't really rely on their eyesight either, so, you know, even if their eyes were to be damaged, it wouldn't be um, that much of a problem for these animals because they are living in an area where there is no light, except for light that's being produced by animals themselves. So you have a lot of bioluminescence in the deep sea, and animals use bioluminescence for a lot of different reasons. Uh, but predators will often cue in on bioluminescent animals uh, and are able to see and hunt them. So that's why a lot of these animals still have eyes and functional eyes because they are detecting these this bioluminescence um, made by other animals and animals can use this to communicate with each other to signal for mates um, to use as a distraction to escape a predator so there are a lot of reasons why bioluminescence exists and other animals will take advantage of that bioluminescence So an article that's available if folk, for folks who want to dig into environmental DNA, uh, there's an open source uh, article that Meredith Everett's a co-author on from 2018. It's in Royal Society Open Science. It's a reputable journal. Uh, water, water everywhere. Environmental DNA can unlock population structure in elusive marine species. College level reading, I think. Uh, but fairly recent overview of the process. Thank you. I think definitely some of our audience would be interested in that. So you think that little bump in the cable is uh, I'm not clear? really, I'm not seeing it. So yeah. Maybe it's gone. Uh, yeah, it'd be good. I mean, I think it gets amplified the, the more wraps you put on, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard to tell. Yeah. From that angle. So it's like maybe right there, is it? Uh, uh, a little swerve. Yeah. Just a just one wrap that's protruding a little bit more. So the next dive uh, is planned for a seamount south of here, and it'll begin at about 3,600 again. Wow. Uh, it's suitable for crusts. Yep. That's what was driving that site selection, plus the weather. <coughs> and then hopefully, uh, Wednesday afternoon, evening, start transiting northward a bit. Are we expecting any of these dives to go over 24 hours? Over 24? No, I don't think so. That's the sweet spot? Yeah, the next one, it should be about 18 to 20 hours.
For those of you wondering about our internship program, um, internships should open sometime within summer 2022 for the 2023 expedition. This year we are focused on providing opportunities for everybody who got um, kind of behind due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but by summer we should be open for new intern applications. And if you keep an eye on our, e our newsletter and our social media, we will be announcing that when they are open. And of course, you can read more about our internship programs and the various types of internships we have through nautiluslive.org. Here's another question from our audience. Why are some fish or animals with seemingly functional eyes don't seem to be disturbed by the light emitted by Hercules? Well, there, well, I mean, it depends on what you describe as being disturbed. So a lot of times these lights are so bright, it, they're just, and their vision is not that great. So they're not reacting to it in the same way that you would react to a flashlight being shined in your eyes. But sometimes you'd see uh, reactions from fish um, like the cutthroat eels. They'll sometimes shake their head or swim backwards uh, when they see the light. Um, but yeah, generally these animals aren't reacting uh, in the same way you might expect an uh, animal that relies on their vision for everything to react. And so you just got to keep in mind that these animals are much different than the ones that we're used to seeing on land. And they're not visually focused. Uh, a lot of animals will actually actively avoid us. So a lot of the fishes will avoid the ROV or in some fishes actually get attracted to the ROV. Um, like last night, there was a rat tail fish that I saw in the Argus view that was just sort of hanging off camera waiting in the light pool to see what's going on. They get curious about what's going on uh, with the ROV. So animals' reactions vary depending on what type of animal they are and how good their vision is. Um, but yeah, I don't believe that our presence and our light is negatively impacting these animals. Um, but that's still something we don't know a lot about is how our presence here affects the animals that we view. Most of them, like corals and sponges, aren't going to be affected at all. Uh, but they don't, they're accessible animals, they don't have vision uh, that could be impacted. But yeah, it's kind of an interesting question and something that scientists think a lot about because we don't want to disturb these environments as we study them. And that's why we've developed the different technologies that we have um, that's to help us better observe these environments without leaving any traces behind. So we have ROVs that can go down and, and collect this really wonderful video, video data uh, that we can take back with us. And the animals and the environment can go on and be productive. There's also AUVs and uh, other different ways that we've devised to, to study these areas that are hard to get to and are absolutely fascinating.
We have some nice shout outs coming you get in. This, Good Jake? job, I'm everybody. Go down and look at it. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, no, I got it. Yeah, and the folks are just joining uh, Nautilus Live feed. Uh, you can, uh, on YouTube, or uh, perhaps on Nautilus Live as well, rewind the video a bit and uh, <coughs> you can see a nice uh, imagery, a nice video of a chimera uh, that we spotted towards the end of the dive. And, and it was very cooperative. We got some great video of it swimming a, along a heavily sedimented uh, seafloor. Yeah, it's probably the, my favorite thing I've seen so far during the dives. <laughs> well, this, uh, so yeah, you weren't with us on our last watch. There was a really bizarre looking uh, gastropod mm. uh, that didn't quite resemble what are in the, what's in the field guide. Um, so I don't know if we spotted a new species, but I'm sure folks will be analyzing that video. Definitely want to follow up on that one. Yeah, that thing was wild. Sizable too, right? Uh, yeah, it was really big. Like the other times we've seen things that are similar, they've been very small. Okay, sounds good. And a little bit before that, we saw a relative of a sea anemone, a coralliform. But <laughs> <laughs> Coralliform was yeah, uh, gonna a bit like different too. looking from others we've seen. So yeah, we got some good rock, good rock samples. Very successful dive. Um, Data, are you about to give us a rundown of the samples we collected on the dive? Sure. So to. For this dive, we collected a total of 21 different samples comprising both geological and biological. Um, should I just go down the list? That'd be great. All right. Sample one was a Niskin sample, so simply the water sample so that we can do the eDNA. Um, sample two was a rock sample collected at 3,400 meters. Uh, we actually collected two rocks down at that depth. We also collected a smaller angular rock. That was sample three. Um, and then we used the slurp containers for the first time to collect a glass sponge. I think that was during Steve's watch. That was a pretty nice looking one. And then we also collected a long octocoral, so a piece of sample from that on the skeleton. And we went forth and collected more rocks that was during our watch last night. Um, so it was one small black rock, and then we went ahead with that big, giant, large rock. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. um, we also collected or grabbed a biological sample of a black coral. That was on this watch? or That was on That's our on. last watch, yes. Um, we also collected that small cup coral that we thought was really interesting. And the first sediment core sample was taken just after our watch last night, after All our right. attempt. Some more rock samples, small glass sponge, a piece of, excuse my pronunciation, Norella coral. Norella sounds good. Norella, yeah. That was attached to a large outcrop. Um, another Niskin sample. And then at around 1,900 meters, they collected a piece of black coral, another Niskin sample. And then here on this watch, we collected that black coral, piece of that black coral. Um, and then of course the sediment samples. And then lastly, the Niskin sample. Yeah, that's quite a All bit right. of samples we got, 21 in total. Nice. We almost filled up everything on Herc. <laughs> Yeah, I rarely see us, um, you know, collect core samples successfully in the deep sea. It just frequently it's re either very thin layer <coughs> or the sediment just doesn't stick. So three is really good. Yeah. And what kind of um, information are they hoping to learn from those? You could look at the 
some geolo geological information in this in the different layers, um, and then biologically you can analyze it for um, small animals that might be living in their invertebrates. Um, so that's why we were we're looking for paired paired core samples. Yeah, so they wanted us to sample uh, two so that we could get one for stratigraphy, which is looking at the geological layers, and then one for uh, the fauna. Makes sense. Yeah, there aren't many samples of in, uh, the inv in fauna, the in invertebrates that live in the sediment. Mm -hmm. Looks like we have viewers from all over the world right now, including Guam. All right. We have some viewers from Guam. Half a day, Manana <laughs> It's early morning there, what, like six, seven, almost 7 a.m. Is it all your family? I'm not sure who's tuning in, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I love seeing the map with the dots. It really is just a worldwide, global connection. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a shout out from my home state, New Jersey. Woot woot. All right. Hello, Jerseyans. It's my home state as well. Really? Down in uh, Camden County. Camden uh, County. <coughs> Oakland. Very cool. I'm from Burlington. Oh, not far away. Not far at all. Yeah, so these family vacations to the Jersey Shore kind of triggered the love of the ocean. I definitely get that. I think when you get to see it every summer, how could you not fall in love with the ocean? <laughs> yeah, as a young kid, I wasn't thrilled with the sand in the swimsuit and the <laughs> horse flies, <laughs> but I learned to body surf as a teenager. I was kind of sold on it. And then I started learning that there are mountains beneath the sea that are comparable to what we have on land, and that blew me away. I had to learn more. And I saw that there was a career in the Navy for oceanographers and a oceanography major at the Naval Academy. And that kind of shaped my career goals there. Where was that based? It, the, in Annapolis, Maryland. Right. So I was invited to visit the summer of my, uh, you know, in between junior and senior year in high school, and I was hooked. And that turned into a 32-year career in the Navy, and most of that as an oceanographer. And uh, Bob Ballard reached out through the Office of Naval Research to get the Naval Academy involved in uh, internships. And that's how my involvement began back in 2013. So you started as an intern? <clears throat> I set up an internship, and, and yes, I, as an uh, intern navigator my first time out. And uh, hopefully we'll start bringing midshipmen, Naval Academy midshipmen, and maybe cadets from the uh, Coast Guard Academy uh, out here as navigators again. Yeah, we've had a few. 
Yep. Just uh, a couple of seasons I was on the uh, Nautilus, so 2016, 2017, uh, we had cadets out. Yeah. I think the first one came out in 2014. Okay. I spent time as a kid on the other coast, on the, uh, on the west coast in uh, the Pacific Northwest. Uh, a lot of time at the beach. Uh, we don't call it the shore on the west coast, we call it the beach. <laughs> don't call it the shore right nope. there. Not call it the shore. Very and different wave climatology on the on the left coast there. Yep, and uh, spent a lot of time as I was, when I was a kid uh, on uh, the northwest Pacific beaches uh, digging clams, uh, and then in uh, Puget Sound uh, fishing, picking oysters, uh, digging uh, clams there, that kind of stuff. My father loved to do that kind of stuff. So a lot of time on the ocean. Gets into your blood. Well, then I didn't do any oceanography until 2005 when I was working at the University of Washington. Wow. And uh, uh, I had a career in, in uh, broadcast video, built TV stations and that kind of stuff, and uh, was working for the campus TV station at UW in Seattle. And the oceanography department came to us and said, we need to find out more about HD cameras and HD video. We'd like to put an HD camera on an ROV. And uh, uh, I ended up going. I ended up building a system for them to record HD, uh, helping consult on uh, the satellite technology to get live HD off the ship, uh, and which hadn't really been done before. And uh, and then went out on the Thompson, the University of Washington's uh, UNOL's ship, the Thompson, uh, for about two and a half weeks off the uh, coast of Vancouver Island in the Endeavour vent field. Um, oh, so yeah. That was my introduction to oceanography. Wow. It was uh, tube worms and thermal vents and HD video for the first time. Uh, Bob was doing HD video uh, in the Atlantic at the say earlier that year in 2005 on the NOR, uh, but they weren't able to get HD video off the ship uh, mm. due to uh, satellite signal strength and that kind of stuff. So I did the first, first HD over IP video streams uh, live from a ship. All right, from the Thompson. Yep, from the Thompson. That's impressive. 2005. Uh, and neither the Navy nor Paul Allen would contradict my claim. <laughs> <laughs> I've since talked to people uh, who were in the Navy at about that time. They said they didn't really know much about any HD video uh, or any video much at all other than targeting kind of stuff. Uh, and then uh, I talked to some guys that uh, we're on, uh, uh, on the Octopus for Vulcan, uh, which is Paul Allen's uh, company and his ship uh, at the time, uh, his private ship, uh, which had an ROV with an HD camera. And he's, uh, those guys told me that they weren't doing HD video back to shore either. Hmm. So uh, I think my claim lies solid. And we won't take it away from you. Well, you know, it's out there. Oh, that. Endeavor Ventfield is amazing. I've never been up there, but boy, the video I've seen is eye-watering. So. I went uh, went back there then 15 years later on Nautilus. We were there working for Ocean Networks Canada, uh, and I got to see the uh, uh, Endeavor Field again uh, after 15 years, and it was just as impressive. And I'd been on Nautilus for several years at that time and seen a lot of really interesting things and that kind of stuff, but that that field is a bit for me. That's one of the, the most amazing features out there. Emil, I don't know if you know, but we're doing some troubleshooting on the winch. Right, so you're... Uh, we're kind of holding depth. Okay. And were you paying it back out? Yeah, I was paying it back out. Uh, about five minutes ago. I don't know. Yeah, we wanted to s see if we we could um, go really, really slow at the lump and see if it would spool correctly.
So are you, are you re, uh, recovering now or still paying out? I've uh, I'm kind of waiting on Bob's signal, but I've been hauling in at okay. our normal speed for the last few minutes. Okay, so probably added about five, ten minutes. Five, ten minutes, yeah. Okay. We were probably going to be up by noon. Yeah, that's then good then. Now um, probably 12.15. That was uh, the preferred <laughs> recovery time, so that's okay. good. I think maybe I'm maybe 12.30. Uh -huh. I don't know. I imagine everybody's really excited to take a look at those samples. Yeah. Finally have something to do. <laughs> yeah, we've got time to, <coughs> we can uh, remain on station for about an hour and give you good conditions to take those samples into the lab and start processing. Yes, please. The wet lab is going to be a fun place to be later today. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just take the forms out of it. I think it was at the Endeavor event field. Uh, I don't know if it's 2020. Uh, that Nautilus set up a very nice shot with uh, turned off Hercules lights, and we're using Argus's lights to, but Herc's camera to uh, record the the shimmering vent. Uh, it's really beautiful imagery of the the shimmer of that hot water coming out of the chimneys. Yeah, it's uh, it's a really neat mirror, effect, upside down mirror effect kind of thing because hot water will pool underneath a ledge and it looks shimmery like uh, like mercury, uh, hmm. very silvery oh. and shimmery. And uh, yeah, it's a really interesting effect. In 2005, uh, we used uh, an elevator, uh, which is like a big uh, pallet with a tower in the middle of it. Uh, and we sent down a whole bunch of lights and batteries. And we picked that up with the ROV and positioned it uh, and uh, lit up a whole area of the, uh, of the vents, vent structures and the tube worms and that kind of stuff. And then uh, drove the ROV, which was uh, Jason, uh, drove the ROV up from in the dark, essentially, into the light pool to reveal the... Mm. Uh, the uh, 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 vent structures and uh, made a very dramatic uh, thing out of it by driving into an existing light pool, which you usually don't see because, of course, uh, other like in our system, other than the lights that we've got on Argus, which don't reach very far, uh, the ROV is bringing its own lights with it. In this case, we had a giant light tree uh, planted in position and then drove into that light field and yeah, made for some really dramatic video. Is that available anywhere? Uh, yeah. Um, UW? Yeah, UW Oceanography, uh, and then search through uh, uh, their uh, history. Um, last time I was at that, the, the event page for that event in 2005 still existed, and you could still see clips. All right. Um, might be worth looking at. Um, uh, I'll think of it here, what, what that event was called. Visions, Vision 05. Okay. Yeah, if you, if you go to the oceanography uh, uh, I don't know. page at uw.edu. Uh, Jelly? Oh, look at that. Oh, Check siphonophore. That out. Beautiful. Wow. That is a curtain of death. All stinging cells hanging down there. Yeah. Nematocysts.
For those of you just tuning in, we are ascending from our 24-hour exploration of Palmyra Atoll National Wildlife Refuge, which lies in, within the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. We are bringing up a good amount of samples by biologic and geologic um, to explore this, this area that's remnants of volcanoes from oh, 100 something million years ago. Oh, uh, so we think the age of uh, this, this platform is about 80, 7 to 80 million years. Still a very long time. <laughs> um, and we're, I think we're in a very unique spot, um, about 950 nautical miles south of Honolulu and halfway between Hawaii and American Samoa. So this is a very uh, pristine environment. And um, we've seen some cool stuff while down here. Yeah, 21 samples. 21 samples. Uh, not a lot of biology. Uh, may not be a lot of uh, nutrients coming down from above, but... Mm. Aaron, could you update the whiteboard at like 1230? Yeah. yeah. But, um, but it was a good site for the geological samples, for sure. We're going to hopefully have some happy geologists on board. Oh, yes. <laughs> So it looks like maybe John Delaney was out there with you, uh, Dave. I was a very lucky man. I had both John Delaney and Deb Kelly as co-PIs co hmm. uh, and got to work with both of those uh, wow. wonderful people. Uh, once again, my introduction to oceanography was at a very high level. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, you know, with the the subject matter uh, at location of the cruise and the crew that I got to work with. Uh, was absolutely fantastic, and I didn't know it at the time. I thought, oh, uh, all oceanography cruises are like this. Uh, <laughs> I found out later that wasn't true, but uh, but still, I mean, every every uh, expedition has its own uh, bonus and, and uh, rewards and, and that kind of stuff. But it was uh, uh, great fun to work with uh, with that crew. Bob Waters was was out there on that. Uh, ah. If you hadn't had a chance to check out some of our social media pages today, uh, that's at Nautilus Live on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, LinkedIn. We are promoting a really cool new video that was done by IFL Science, where they interviewed some OET members on our contributions to the efforts to map the ocean by 2030. So check out that interview video, um, again, on our Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, um, and get a little taste of some of our mapping efforts. Yeah, the multi-beam is another part of the uh, 
new age in ocean exploration. So that's a, so developed in the 60s for the Na U.S. Navy, uh, made commercially available in the 80s. Uh, and now it's the instrument of choice for deep sea mapping. But there's a lot of work to do but <laughs> to hit that 2030 goal. Mm -hmm. And it's going to probably involve autonomous vehicles as well as ships to get close to that goal. But so we did a little bit of multi-beaming, uh, three tracks right above this dive site that helped us uh, improve the waypoint planning. There were some artifacts in the existing data, so uh, the new data we collected was a bit cleaner. And we'll be doing a bit more mapping uh, before this cruise is over. Alani, I don't suppose you were able to get a, a screen grab of that uh, siphonophore that went by. It was so quick. Oh, you tried? All right. Oh, yeah. All right. Oh, very good. Well done. Oh. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So for the question, um, someone's asking about video available of the full 24-hour dive. Yes, we do put up videos of the full dives. Um, uh, I would say give it maybe 72 hours, is that correct? It does take a little while to get it up, but we do have a YouTube page dedicated just to previous full dives if you want to watch the entire thing. And if you go to YouTube and search Nautilus Live Dive Recordings, you'll find it that way. fast forward through all this. <laughs> And someone's asking um, what some of our personal highlights have been so far of the dive. Does anyone want to answer that? Hmm. Oh, the Camara is so an easy many. one. Yeah. 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 Camara is a great shot. Um, that uh, strange gastropod, I think we got a really good look at that. Um, it was cool seeing those uh, two sharks at the beginning of the dive. 
And they're still oh. hanging around the ship, actually. Oh, the <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's the high-density rock at the beginning of the dive. That was yeah, uh, interesting. Yeah, a that lot of biodiversity cool. there. I like the plural brank. It's so cute. That was my favorite. Oh, that it was guy. interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was the only one, right? That the stalk the dive. The whole dive saw? Yeah, I think so. I got a kick out of the uh, hermit crab with the coral. <laughs> the fashion crab. Yeah. I enjoyed the legendary push cores. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that too. You're a legend, well done, legend, legend in your own time. Legendary movements of Jake are a personal highlight. Yeah, I mean, to putting away that first one in the cloud, oh my gosh, I have found that slot. Yeah, I saw the uh, the white tip sharks right out there, right before we got on. Mm. Mm -hmm. it was <laughs> just sticking around, just waiting yeah, for something to around. fall off the deck that they no eat. Probably just because of all of the birds. Um. Yeah, all the, <laughs> all the extra fish that's uh, going over the side there. <laughs> Megan was telling me earlier that the lights at night also attract squid and stuff uh -huh. that they might be eating. Ah, yeah, okay. I believe that. Yeah, it can be a feeding frenzy. It definitely is really cool to look down from deck and just see a shark right under the water just swimming alongside. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for our next dive, um, was it this, af this, this evening I think maybe? this evening, we'll uh, work on the dive plan um, this afternoon, but I, I think uh, that about 6 p.m. local, uh, midnight east coast is a good rough guess. Yeah. That makes sense, yeah, it drives it off the box, yeah. Yeah. Right. In Alvin, you point the... It'd be another two-hour two hour descent. Those up. <laughs> another deep one. <laughs> well, you can only go over, you know, like six degrees, which feels like you're, like, laying on the... <laughs> but it definitely makes a difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's still, it goes up and down pretty fast. Yeah, yeah. It, it can get up to 50. So, yeah. But you're dropping a thousand pounds of steel on the bottom, you know, so... <laughs> <laughs> they do eventually disappear. Oh, what do we got there? <laughs> oh, what's that? I mean, we have over I'm 50 gonna years of guess another siphonophore. Another siphonophore yeah, Test data. very different looking. <laughs> yeah, definitely a different one. I think we're going to start to see a lot more cool stuff as we get close to the surface. One audience member would like to know what we're looking forward to most um, for the rest of the expedition. Everything I don't know, it's going to be there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All the surprises. That's it. Uh, some of the most interesting discoveries are made while you're looking for one thing and then you find this other that you just did not expect. Uh, I've, but always hoping for high density, high diversity coral and sponge gardens because mm -hmm. that attracts other species. 
Well, this is my first deep sea exploration, so everything has been fascinating, and I look forward to you know seeing what comes next. I come from Guam, where we don't really do deep sea exploration research. We're more, you know, like coral, a lot of coral research, just because we have a lot of coral biodiversity, uh, fish biodiversity. So this is definitely very different, and it's making me appreciate a totally different discipline in marine science, and I'm just enjoying every second of it. It's very well said. Grateful for the opportunity. And you study at the University of Guam. Yes, I do. Born and raised on Guam and stayed there for school. <laughs> And what is your research focus on? My research is focused on the reef-associated fisheries, particularly non-commercial fisheries, which is a very poorly studied um, fisheries on Guam. We know a lot about our commercial fisheries, but very little about our non-commercial, which is really surprising because, you know, non-commercial is the subsistence fishing. It's the um, fish that's feeding the people, um, ending up on their dinner tables, and so... I think it's just been a lot of like lack in local capacity when it comes to science in general, but like not many people actually are studying fisheries on Guam. There's, I can, I, I have enough fingers to count them all. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as someone who fishes myself and just someone being from Guam and seeing the situation that's going on in our reefs in terms of like over exploitation and things like that, I just felt like that was my, it's my niche. That's something where I can kind of fit in. And so far, I've been I've been really loving it. So I've um, my research focuses on some pretty fundamental aspects of non-commercial fisheries. So just um, identifying important trends that may be useful for management. So across different fish regions in Guam, across different fishing methods. So like size structure variation, uh, species assemblage, composition, harvested biomass, and again. Uh, to assist in like generating appropriate management recommendations, but also to maybe even update whatever management we currently have just because everyone's fishing year round and staying up to date on fisheries is really important. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I'm well, I look forward to seeing some, some more of your work. Yeah, I hope to graduate um, hopefully December. <laughs> My data collection period ends uh, end of May. So as I'm here on EV Nautilus, I'm actually taking digital submissions for creole data. So implementing, you know, like technology and taking data that way. Usually I meet with fishermen and fisherwomen to be there, measure their catch, gather the data, but I also, a big part of my data collection is digital submissions, and so that's gone a long way, and as I'm out here, I'm still receiving some great data from a lot of very helpful participants, so, yeah. And as an ocean science intern, we're actually getting some questions from people who are interested sure. in this internships. Um, people from different backgrounds. For example, we have a veterinary technician interested. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's safe to say that our internships are a little bit more open than you might think. Oh, uh, yeah, for sure. We are definitely sure. open to people of different backgrounds. I mean, look at me. I have zero background in deep sea exploration, geology, or anything. Like I said, I, I come from Guam, where we mostly do coral and fish stuff and no deep sea at all. So I was surprised and very thankful that I actually got selected. <laughs> um, but I mean, you can be, I feel like OET is very welcoming people of diverse backgrounds. So I say, give it a shot. Why not? We've Explore even had artists different. out here, mm -hmm. artists at sea program. Artists, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Awesome. Oh. Yeah, we encourage anyone to apply for our internships. Um, as I mentioned before, in case you didn't hear, the um, application period should be opening sometime in summer 2022. And if you keep an eye on our social media and sign up for our newsletters, you'll get more exact dates of when those are open so that you can apply to be a part of the team yourself. Yep, I just saw a flyer. Well, it was actually my boss, Fran Castro, who's friends with Megan Cook. <laughs> they go to school together, and she sent me a flyer, and I just, I applied. It was a very easy, simple process, and um, everyone one that interviewed me was, you know, very, very kind, and I, 
not very intimidating at all. So it was it was a smooth process and definitely encourage anyone to apply. A week and a almost a week and a half out and this has been one of the best experiences ever, so very thankful. It feels somehow longer and shorter than that at I the same know. time. It feels like we've been out here maybe <laughs> like at least two weeks. <laughs> I think it's just because we're on, you know, the same vessel for yeah. every hour of every day. Um, so both you, Leilani, and myself, Jamie, this is our first voyage. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we're seeing everything through brand new eyes. Yep. I have a new appreciation for solid ground. And <laughs> <laughs> and Dramamine. <laughs> you have a very good appreciation for Dramamine. I will say, though, everyone kept telling me that, you know, your body will adjust and it'll get better. And for a few days, I was, I, I don't know how it will. Mm -hmm. But then it did. And now I'm much happier. So it's true. I it agree. It gets better. Yep. It's good. To be fair, it was pretty rough in the beginning. It's a rough yeah, ride. I heard it was yeah. one of the most rough, roughest. We don't Transits. like. <laughs> we don't like to have the seas on the beam. Mm -hmm. <coughs> seas on the beam, but there's no way around it to go south from Honolulu yep. to here, with the trade winds blowing from the east. So, yeah. That was Rocking wild. And rolling. Yeah. And to answer more questions about what ship life is like with a bunch of scientists, whether there's a lot of shop talk, that's the direct question. Yes, but I don't think anyone minds. I think no. that we're all just super interested curious people and i know i learn hundreds of new things every day that i'm out here from everyone that i work with mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i agree and it's not all the time we also talk about hobbies and other passions yes we do talk about non-ship things as well mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's a lot of dog photos lots of dog photos cat photos cat photos a lot more people are into wordle now yeah wordle. <laughs> i think ryan introduced a whole bunch of people on board to wordle <laughs> You got me thinking about my cat now. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking about my dog. That's the hardest my part, puppy. is being away from our pets. Mm -hmm. And, like, they don't understand. You know, like you can tell people where you're going, but, like, your dog just, yeah. just doesn't know, or your pet just doesn't know. That's definitely the hardest part. <laughs> There's a fish. Oh. Yeah. Good eye. Oh, I didn't see that. So getting back to the Safana Forest, the uh, Schmidt Ocean Institute was underway in the exploring the uh, Ninga Ningaloo Canyons off of Western Australia in the Indian Ocean, uh, 2020, and they, with their ROV Sebastian, came across a 150-foot-long Siphana Four. It's the uh, wow. apparently the longest animal ever That's observed. Insane. Wow. We saw quite a few off the uh, California coast, Southern California coast, in the, that uh, California borderlands area. We did some midwater transects specifically looking for them. With uh, Amanda Netburn, who was at NOAA and is now currently detailed to the White House uh, Office of Science and Technology. Very cool. Yeah, midwater column expert. Yeah, the water column is the largest biome on our planet. There is so much space between the surface and the deep sea where we were studying the bottom, all those benthic invertebrates and fishes, but most of the biomass on Earth is here in the water column. Right. So is the water column, when you refer to it, that's most of it, right? Like yeah, how, how that's, far? That's like from the surface to the bottom. That's the water column. Basically all of the water. Yes. All of the water. <laughs> that's a lot of water. It's crazy to think how much water is below the ship. Yeah. Like how much ocean is and underneath And even just us. looking out, you know, when you're on deck, it's just ocean mm -hmm. everywhere you turn. It really is humbling in a way. Mm -hmm. 
but when you consider the size of the Earth, so the uh, the depth of the ocean could be approximated by taking a basketball and dunking it in water, and then the, bring it up, and the water that's clinging to the surface is how deep the oceans are relative to the Earth's size. So wow. it's a thin. Mm, that's a good metaphor. Yeah, a thin uh, layer supporting life. Fish. Oh, I had read an article in uh, New Scientist about there's water trapped down in the mantle and a special kind of... Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's like three times as much water as on the surface trapped in the... In, in the, the rock. In a yeah. mantle rock, yeah. Hmm. Yes, yeah, in well, the... Wood, wood something? Wood night or... I don't remember. Oh. But anyway, uh, serpentine? I don't remember the name of the element or yeah, uh, but it's crystal, a, but yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's interlocked in there. It's not yeah, like available. If all that was on the surface, it, only the mountaintops would be poking up out of the water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so serpentine's a mineral that you get when you uh, subduct oceanic crust. Um, it's a, a metamorphic mineral, and it's really hydrous. Um, and then when you are subducting it, uh, and you subject it to high pressure and temperature, the water kind of gets squeezed out of the serpentine mineral and it ends up melting things. So that's how you get back arc volcanoes on land. Um, yeah, I think this other, this, what I was talking about, it's like way down. Oh, down, down. Yeah, like you don't find it on the surface because it's like under such tremendous pressure that you don't find it other than like Oh. It's in diamonds, I guess. You can find it inside diamonds. Are you thinking Worcestonite? Yeah, that's it. Worcestonite. Yeah. Nice. Geology expert. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all of those reading groups about <laughs> long, long hours of reading groups finally coming to you. <laughs> but yeah, before I had this job, um, the serpentine the metamorphic mineral, another form of it is uh, you can get it in kind of like this spiky form. Um, and it's a name that probably most people are familiar with is asbestos. And oh. so my job before this was, ooh, oh, that's a Lismus. cool thing. Oh, what was that? The jelly called Slismus. Uh, but my job before this, I was working at, uh, I actually worked at two different professional labs uh, looking for asbestos and construction and building materials, um, which is definitely interesting. <laughs> See, mm. they really just used to put it in everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Along with lead. <laughs> yeah. Our shore facility is having all the piping replaced because it's all, it was, the building was built like in the 1920s and it's got lead pipes and all the oh. fire systems and stuff. Yeah. yeah. I mean, asbestos is uh, pretty cool because um, it's fire resistant. So that's why it was so useful. So they put it in everything. They put it in pots and pans and socks and clothes oh and yeah. insulation and paint and tiles and <laughs> working pipes. materials, oh. concrete, <laughs> <laughs> everything. And uh, yeah, then eventually they realized that uh, since it's like, so like spiky, it ends up stabbing your lungs and giving you cancer. <sighs> so that's, that's not good. Cutie. And for those who are asking, we're anticipating another dive uh, later this evening around 6 p.m. Hawaii time, which is midnight Eastern time, should everything go as planned. So stay tuned for that. Yeah, we'll have to transit to the next site, check out the uh, the winds and waves are expected to be the same. The currents, very hard to predict in this area, uh, and they've been strong. 
So we hope for favorable conditions uh, a little further south of here. <clears throat> the south equatorial current flows west with bringing cooler water west. North equatorial countercurrent flows east, warmer water. What and we're, Jake? we're at the interface bogus. between the two. So you get these little waves. Uh, I don't need your little hint. Sheer. No. Between those two current systems. Turn oh, carrot another browsing. nice. Carrot browsing. <laughs> oh, two floaty things. Two of them. Wow. Oh. No carrot browsing. You want to no guess carrots. what that is? Uh, a floaty thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's what? actually a sea cucumber Whoa. called Lagothuria. Huh. A sea I wouldn't have guessed that. Yeah, it's a sea baguette. It's a sea cucumber. <laughs> Pelagothria nataeatix. See <laughs> <laughs> <Sea> broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> Those do fade, right? The yeah. viewers don't <laughs> see that, right? <laughs> yeah, you have to clear up. Oh, oh it's a cyanophore. See, I told you it was going to get interesting. <laughs> <laughs> they go broccoli. so fast, though. It's it's hard to pin them down. Yeah, well, that's because we're going fast. That's true. We're going fast, so it's hard to pin them down. It's like deep sea flash cards. <laughs> so hopefully you'll be relieved by the 12 to 4 here, but uh, yeah, if we not, discussed it with them. We'll shove off. I mean, we're, we're still. 40 something minutes away. So. Yeah. yeah. What's your favorite thing that you guys have seen during blue water? Pilot whale, sharks. Wow, pilot whale, that's cool. Okay. Now I'm jealous. Uh, Same. <laughs> squid attack, just like. Yeah, I love when they run into. Squid. Inking. The inking uh, squid. Yeah. I saw that video. Where'd you see with pilot whale in the video? Swordfish. Oh or yeah, <laughs> yeah, right when we. Uh, it was well, the was first dive that of ran into one of the Pisces subs. Oh wait. Well, it, there, one got wedged in the yeah. Alvin back in the yeah, 60s or 70s, and they <laughs> ate it for dinner. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, my goodness. Fresh fish. That's one way to fish. <laughs> There's a picture of it online. Man, man sub fishing. Yeah, the swordfish are really territorial. <laughs> uh, but the pilot whale was uh, the first dive of NA-135 when we first got in the water. It was There's there. the Herc video? Yeah. Wow. wow that's yeah, awesome. it, it was Whoa. just like hanging out underneath oh. the ship. I think that might have been another larvation creation. Green? That's yeah, just the way that camera is. Uh, we're looking at a replacement for the bubble cam, 4K. Really? Yeah. A security yeah. camera that, yeah. So maybe. Yeah, the bubble cams from what, like Yeah, it's old. <laughs> Panasonic. Yeah, they That's only made Panasonic. a few of those, too. Special, special edition. Like maybe six or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Maybe. But, you know, <laughs> yeah, but every other 
bubble camera like that, deep sea bubble camera, the, the glass breaks. It crazes at the interface between the titanium and the glass. Oh. Yeah, that, that one's lasted a long time. So very good housing, but you have to find a camera that exactly matches the yeah. dimensions of the other one to keep it from being distorted. Yeah. That'd be pretty cool. 4K on that. Yeah. There's the yeah. Siphana 4. Oh, wow. Yeah. Whoa. Whoa. Well, that's so that's an IP camera we're looking at. So <laughs> it's an Axis camera. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was just I was looking at a shootout of all these different you know different security cameras and the axis was like leaps and bounds better than all the rest so yeah yeah right yeah We just need one that matches the dimensions of the old Panasonic module, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't, I don't, you know, did we have, buy a bunch of cameras and just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, yeah. That's one of my tasks. So. Well, if you want to weigh in on it, I would be happy to hear. <laughs> Dan's looking at it too. Yep. Okay. Right. Yep. Seeing a lot of little things moving past the camera. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of little jellies out there. Oh, what's that on the Argus cam? Oh, wait. Hey. Good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. be going offline here to help set up the deck for recovery. Make sure Mark's got enough folks on hand. Oh, 
Oh, look at that. How are we looking for um, time to the surface? Uh, like 20 after or something, maybe? Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks. For the audience member asking about the red timer above the winch display, it's not actually a timer, it's actually a clock that displays ship time. Um, it's kind of hard to see in your view, so I can see why that would be confusing. I don't have a camera that uh, that will shoot the clock, but it's just a, mm -hmm. a giant time display for uh, UTT, UTC time, which is uh, 2148.50 right now. Just a reminder for any educators watching, you can schedule a ship to shore interaction through our website where we connect you straight with some of our scientists and science communication fellows, right to your students or your audiences or your learners of whatever kind. Um, and you can have a direct experience and ask questions.
control shift colon? Semicolon? Semicolon. Yeah. Hello. Hey. Not the new. Not the new, still blue. Yeah. The only thing is the jars being slow. <laughs> no, you go. See ya. For those of you just turning in, we are very close to a watch change. We are ascending from our um, position on Palmyra Atoll and hoping to be recovering on deck in 20 to 30 minutes, I think. All right. Well, I mean, we don't know yet, but <laughs> we're going to start streaming at 300, right? So we'll see. I mean, we're not blowing way off to the side, so, so far, okay. Jake was doing the windshield wiper thing. What's that? Oh, you, you, you lateral and it makes it come up a little bit faster? Oh, Raj. Should I? Uh, I think it's already, it's already set. Yeah, yeah, it's already good. Stick lock. Yeah, better start packing up. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got time. Yeah. Gabby's right behind me. She was right behind right. me. Still there. Watch.
Hey. We're going to just do this year recovery. There you go. Thanks for delivering. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to do 300. Roger. catch up a little bit and then we'll be in the flange. Bridge Nav. 